And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 3.30 in the afternoon. Stay tuned next for Making Contact. This week on Making Contact... Before I became governor of the great state of Alaska, I was mayor of my hometown. I guess a small town mayor is sort of like a community organizer, except that you have actual responsibilities. Yes, that was Sarah Palin, former Republican candidate for vice president of the United States, mocking candidate Obama for being a community organizer. That sparked a lot of interest. So what is community organizing? On this program, Women Rising Radio features highly effective, visionary community organizers whose work has gone global, strengthening grassroots movements that are nothing short of revolutionary. Sarah Palin, an avowed evangelical Christian, might be surprised to find out that each of these global justice activists is firmly rooted in her own faith. Ruth Messenger heads the American Jewish World Service. The social justice issues which I have always recognized came significantly from my Judaism. Amber Kahn is Senior Director of Communications at Women for Women International. I was born to parents who really provided this foundation of faith and commitment, we have an obligation, a responsibility to engage and to do what we can. Global media and religion are often used in shaping public opinion to support a creed of greed that dismisses the demand for social justice and promotes hero worship of the richest 1%. In response to the growing gap between rich and poor, a strong civil society is expanding worldwide, driven by compassion. Many of these grassroots movements are spearheaded and supported by visionary women like Ruth Messenger. I think it's fair to say that I was raised as a Jew in and of a family that was about social justice, that was about giving back. I'm a child of or a young adult activist of the 60s, so I had every opportunity to be out there on the front lines and working for social justice, and I did. I'm always attracted to the notion that we should pursue justice for two reasons. One is it's justice. It's not charity. It's not giving to the other. It's helping create a more equitable and fair society. And the second notion is it's about pursuing. So it's not like, wait for it, hang back. It's, you know, the line from Sweet Honey and the Rock. It's we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. So I take that as being a very Jewish expression, although not how it was (laughs) intended by them, perhaps. At American Jewish World Service, I've come to rely very strongly on another teaching, and that is B'Tselem Elohim, the notion that people are equally made in the image of God. Because we put a huge emphasis in American Jewish World Service on finding people who are making social change in the developing world and then on listening to them. Many governments and large international non-governmental organizations go to Africa, Asia, Latin America with their own notions of what will help. And they launch sometimes very, very large scale and expensive efforts without actually listening to people. And so that means two things for me. One is very simple. It's the commandment, Shema, listen. But the other thing is, if you really believe that everyone is equally made in the image of God, then you would not imagine that the solution to the land wars in Mexico are going to come from Geneva or London or New York or San Francisco. They're going to come only when people pay attention to the people on the ground, to how they understand their right to the land, their ownership of the land, the role that the land plays in their culture. We have more to learn from them than we have to teach them. That which touches me most is that I had a chance to work with people passing on to others that which was passed on to me. Come on. We believe in freedom and freedom. 
I had imagined when I got my degree in social work that I was intended to be a caseworker. And by the time I finished school and finished a year of work, I had decided I was meant to be a community organizer and social change agent. So I did that back in New York for a period of about 11 years, during which I was working on issues of expanding daycare, issues of trying desperately to change and improve the local public school system, and issues of low-income housing in the neighborhood where I lived. I love local politics. I ran for the school board and won, then I ran for the state assembly and lost, then I ran for the city council and won, and that opened up an opportunity to be in local government, which I think is the best place to have fun and make change, for 20 years representing the borough of Manhattan, and it prepared me for all the things I've done since then. When I came to American Jewish World Service in 1998, it was 13 years old because this year is our 30th anniversary. It was 13 years old and it was probably helping about 15 or 20 projects around the world. And we are now the leading Jewish organization working to realize human rights and end poverty in the global south. And we support 530 grassroots organizations in 19 countries. Ruth Messenger enjoys talking about the American Jewish World Service's grassroots activists and the work they're doing in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. There are lots and lots of different examples. Tostan is an organization in Senegal that was started by an American who went to Senegal, married a Senegalese, and was living there. And American Jewish World Service contacted the CEO of Tostan, a woman named Molly Melching, and asked what she wanted to do next and how we might be able to help. And very much in the AJWS spirit, Molly said, actually don't know, I have to go consult the women I've been working with. Molly came back to us and said, the women most want to learn about their own bodies and their own health. And I want to design a curriculum that we can use with women in different villages to do that teaching. And we funded the design of that curriculum and the essence of that curriculum is that healthcare is a human right. And as that curriculum was launched in a variety of villages, a woman in one of the health classes said, if healthcare is a human right, then why do we practice female genital cutting, which we actually know disturbs the health and the bodies of some of us and many of our daughters and has actually led to some deaths. And you know, it's just like all of the stories that you hear all over the world. It was that woman and then that group that decided to organize against this practice. And what we did was fund them. What they did was just extraordinary. They went to other villages. They went to imams. They found an imam who was willing to work with them and go village to village and say, this is not a good practice and it is not required by the Koran. So they have just proceeded step by step over what is now close to 20 years to eliminate the practice in Senegal, to teach people in several other countries about the process of making change. A grantee of ours won the Goldman Environmental Prize and her name is Ikal Angale. She's a Kenyan native from the northern part of Kenya in the Lake Turkana region. Ikal was working in Nairobi as a young woman on a research project of some kind and discovered that the government of Ethiopia, which borders on Kenya, had launched a huge effort, I mean multi, multi-million dollar project, to build a hydropower dam. But in this case, the construction of the dam would have dammed up the Omo River, which flows between Ethiopia and Kenya, and the impact of damming up the river would fairly quickly lower the water level in Lake Turkana by 30 feet. And Ikal knew, and the government of Kenya seemed to be paying no attention to the fact that there are fisher people, herders, and farmers who depend on Lake Turkana, and there are 450,000 of them. They are indigenous people in various tribal groups that live around this very, 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 very large lake. And when American Jewish World Service staff met Ikal, she told our staff that she was going to found an organization called Friends of Lake Turkana to fight this dam. 
And so we are the first and very proud funders of Friends of Lake Turkana. The government of Kenya has withdrawn its support for the dam. The World Bank has withdrawn its support for the dam. And for that, ICAO won a prize and is continuing to work as a real leader in Africa on the question of water and water resources. Please understand I have endless stories like this, and I'm very proud of them. And I'm also very proud of very much smaller grassroots organizations that are stepping forward at risk of their lives. I'm thinking particularly of our land rights defenders and our LGBTI activists who are organizing even though colleagues of theirs have been murdered. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. More recently, AJWS worked to help contain the Ebola crisis and to end the pandemic with a Liberian partner, the Bassa Women's Development Association, or BOWODA. Women Rising Radio spoke with BOWODA's executive director, Martha Karnga, who headed up that work in Liberia. During the Ebola crisis, we purchased 400 buckets and washing materials that we distributed among the affected areas, all of the districts in Grand Bassa County, in Buchanan City. We organized workshops where we trained people what was Ebola and what we needed to do to stop Ebola from coming to us and so we organized workshops for people with disability, with religious leaders, with women groups, with elders and we gave the, the washing materials along with the buckets. We went to one area called Jacob Latter Town and that town was barely infested. About 32 persons died from Ebola in that area. It was a hard to reach place. But we braved the storm and we went there. We saw the area, we distributed buckets. And from there, we went through the media and other humanitarian organizations who went in and sent in food and then medical supplies. We come on the radio and we do the same kind of work that we do in the community on the radio so that women who are far away can also benefit. That was Martha Karnga, Executive Director of Vasa Women's Development Association, describing Bowoda's Ebola Awareness Campaign. Thank you. In addition to creating successful partnerships from Liberia to Cambodia to the Dominican Republic and beyond, AJWS lobbies Congress and the White House on foreign policy to strengthen the work of their global partners on the ground. Our current focus in the Congress is on the International Violence Against Women Act. It's a very straightforward piece of legislation that hasn't passed the last four times it was introduced in the Congress. So this is now the fifth time. It has great sponsors, including Senator Barbara Boxer. We've been working to help educate members of Congress about it, to try to get more members of Congress, particularly, I would say, Republicans, to agree to co-sponsor it so that it will have a chance of passage. And we run into, like, virtually every kind of myth you could imagine, people who don't think this is a serious problem, despite what they can now read in the headlines. And then a lot of people in Congress who are just certain that somehow this piece of legislation is secretly a cover for something about abortion, which, you know, you have to be able to read, but it doesn't ever talk about abortion. Considering the presence and influence of American Jewish World Service around the globe, Women Rising Radio producer Lynn Feinerman asked Ruth Messenger why her organization doesn't work in Israel and Palestine. Ruth responds. 
our feeling is there are many, many groups there, and we are the Jewish group that works basically in the rest of the world. We target 19 countries, which from a long-range position isn't nearly enough, but we don't do any work in Israel or Palestine or surrounding areas. I will say that we do work in several Muslim countries, and we work with grassroots organizations in other countries that are Hindu and Buddhist and Christian backgrounds. So we're very diverse and very interfaith, but not in the Middle East. Under Ruth's direction, American Jewish World Service empowers innovative grassroots leaders, many of them women, to achieve a global humanitarian vision. We think it's critical to not only be working to make change in the developing world or in the global south, as it's called, but to make sure that that change involves the people who live there and recognizes and elevates their voices, sometimes brings their voices quite literally to Washington, because we've done that. We've brought Haitian activists to Congress to say it would really be nice if we had a clue where the so-called money appropriated after the Haiti earthquake was going. Again, it's trying to elevate the voices that would otherwise not be listened to. And it's the commandment, Shema, listen. You're listening to Making Contact. This week's program is produced by the Women Rising Radio Project. Visit us at womenrisingradio.com or radioproject.org. Zainab Salbi began life in a conflict zone. Growing up under the tyranny of Saddam Hussein's Iraq, Zainab witnessed the effects of violence and war on women and children. She founded Women for Women International to help women survivors rebuild their lives and heal their communities. At an event marking International Women's Day, Zainab spoke about this work. When I was 23 years old, I was a recent immigrant from Iraq. I uh, heard about the rape camps and concentration camps in Bosnia. It was 1993. I was like, well, you've got to do something. We can't just watch and we see rape camps and concentration camps in the midst of Europe, in the heart of Europe, and all of us look the other direction and say, tomorrow we'll do something. And that's how the journey starts. So I embarked upon going to war zones. At that time was Bosnia. And since then it became Kosovo and Afghanistan and Rwanda and Iraq and Nigeria and southern Sudan. So that's how I started Women for Women International. And then 18 years later, I decided that it is time for me to start a new journey. I decided to actually step down as the CEO of Women for Women after growing up the organization from only serving 30 women to 300,000 women 18 years later and from having zero amount of money to sending 100 million dollars to women survivors of wars. So, as Rumi says, out beyond the worlds, and Rumi is a 13th century Sufi poet for those of you who don't know him, out beyond the worlds of right doings and wrong doings, there is a field. I shall meet you there. When the soul lies down in that field, there is no language, ideas, all of it becomes irrelevant. So I hope to see you in the field. Zainab Salbi offered the poetry of Rumi to convey the reach of her global vision. She credits her Muslim upbringing as a source of her passion for peace, equality, and public service. In her writings, she refers to herself as both a Muslim and a universalist to explain why she responds so deeply to the suffering of others, especially women. In 2011, Zainab moved on to create her new talk radio show, Nida A, to give Arab women a public forum. And new leadership stepped up at Women for Women International. Amber Khan carries the banner as Senior Director of Communications. And just as it was for Zainab, Women for Women isn't just a job for Amber, it's a calling. I was born in Karachi, Pakistan. And I think that the experiences of, of being an immigrant in this country, I think the experiences of going back to Pakistan and meeting cousins who were less fortunate, they weren't given the opportunity to be educated. 
and they were married young. And I see, I see the journey that they take and the challenges that they face. They're members of my family, women in my family who've suffered from severe depression, who've been victims of rape and violence. And the absence of a structure and a place to heal and the culture that silences those experiences and those traumas has been really difficult to witness. And I think that part of what draws me so profoundly to Women for Women International's work and vision is that it doesn't look away. In fact, it seeks to engage and recruit and enroll women who are isolated, who have not been given an opportunity to heal, who have not had access to resources or networks of support. And I feel extraordinarily privileged to be able to be part of this organization to sponsor sisters and and to support it both professionally and personally. When Women for Women was founded in 1993, rape was used as a weapon of war. I mean, since that time, we've seen the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. It was the first time it was formed where sexual violence and rape were successfully prosecuted as war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. That set a new legal precedent. On the global stage, we saw the passage of UN Security Council 1325. 1325, and we're celebrating that anniversary this year, the 15th anniversary of that passage, acknowledged the changing nature of warfare and that warfare that specifically targeted women is something that can be addressed and can be remediated. And that can only happen when women's voices and women are engaged in negotiating peace and ending conflict. And my hope is that we are then able to mobilize public will and political support for enforcing laws that prevent gender-based violence. And we know that that's possible. We've worked some of the hardest places where gender-based violence is prevalent. I mean, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we have engaged in a really unique men's training with soldiers, educating soldiers who are often perpetrators of violence against women and girls, on recognizing the signs, on their responsibility for interceding and preventing. And it has made a tremendous difference. The work that we see our partners doing, I think, demonstrates that there is a tipping point and a point at which there is a recognition that this isn't just an age-old problem that's always going to be there, but that, in fact, we have it within our reach to do something. Women for Women International helped pioneer the model of microcredit, giving small loans to women survivors to help them reestablish themselves in community. The loans were made on a one-to-one basis from sister to sister. Then the model was expanded into a 12-month training program in saving and investing money, improving skills, starting new businesses, and exercising their human rights. Women enroll in groups of about 25 where they often establish supportive friendships, but the sister-to-sister sponsorship model has proven to be the most powerful anchor in the work of Women for Women International. Amber Khan explains. One of the things that I think is really amazing about Women for Women's model, it's not just the program on the ground, but it is the first message they get that you're enrolled and you have a sponsor and her name is. And that model immediately connects her to a woman or man, but majority are women, who doesn't know her but is invested in her. And women have the opportunity to write letters to the women who sponsor them. The letters have been one of the most profound experiences that supporters of Women for Women have felt. I know I felt it. I mean, I work at Women for Women. And when I signed up to sponsor before joining the staff and I received the letter that sent me a picture with Mary's name and told me that Mary lives in South Sudan and she has four boys and she was widowed. It just, I can't explain it. It just touched me to know that 
I don't have to wait for another institution. I don't have to wait for someone else to reach some anonymous person. I can reach her. And the ability to send her cards and know that she has received them and to to get her letters and her small notes just keep me going. And sometimes when I'm having a bad day, I think about what she's survived, what she's been able to go through. And I think my experience is not unique. I mean, we've had... This year alone, we had 24,000 sponsors from over 75 countries sponsor the women in our programs. And since 1993, we've had nearly 1 million letters exchanged between sponsors and their sisters. Here is a message from Josephine to her sponsor. I'm really touched to see that you still remember me and I hope that you visit me soon. I want you to see what my new life looks like, so I'm sending you a few photos of me with my son. <laughs> Tiffany Reed, a sponsor with Women for Women, shares a letter from her sister. I want to share with you a letter from my sister Rose from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Dearest friend, Hi, greetings to you. My family and I are fine doing. I'd like to inform you that my vocational skill at the Women for Women International program has been the soap making that I enjoy so much. I will be working with my fellow women in group in order to earn a living. Sponsoring a woman is important to me because I'm inspired every single day by the courage and the resilience of these women living under almost constant war and conflict, and I want to be a part of that. I know for Tiffany, I've spoken to Tiffany, and she lights up when she talks about her sister, and she holds those letters dear to her. And recently, my colleague, Jennifer, just came back from Rwanda, and she was telling me the story of one of the women who had graduated in the program who came to meet her. And she pulled out from her shirt that she held inside, close to her chest, this folded, wrinkled letter that was from her sponsor. And through a translator, she told Jennifer that she carries this with her everywhere because Whenever she feels like she's no one, she knows she's someone. And that someone who didn't even know her cared about her. And I think that experience is what connects us. I think for women in particular, it's what knits us together and holds us together. That we have each other's back. That's it for this Women's Desk edition of Making Contact. This program was produced by the Women Rising Radio Project. Special thanks to Leslie Patterson, Christopher Yarwo in Bassa County, Liberia, Gloria Minot at WPFW Radio in Washington, D.C., and to John Abramson, and to the staff at the National Radio Project. Music courtesy of Sweet Honey in the Rock, Bob Marley, the women of Bawoda, and women singers of Rwanda. Women Rising Radio's audio engineer is Stephanie Welch. Our producer is Lynn Feinerman. And I'm your host, Sandina Robbins. Thanks for listening. Community Resources for Independent Living invites you to Heard It Through the Grapevine, a 36th anniversary fundraiser extravaganza. A Motown-themed wine-tasting event on Sunday, October 18th from 5 to 8 p.m. at Las Positas Vineyards in Livermore, 1828 Wetmore Road. Your ticket includes wine tasting, appetizers, music, Motown-themed costumes, and a live silent auction. Participants must be 21 or older. This event is wheelchair accessible and will benefit community resources for independent living. For more info, visit www. 